All right, let's go ahead and get started. So, these discussion sessions, we're going to do them all semester long. The, the point is to, 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 to grab a paper or something vaguely related to microbiology, um, make you guys look at the paper, and think about some of the interesting topics it brings up. These are fairly free form. I'm going to give, a, at this time, a, a, I don't know, a 20 minute dis, uh, discussion of the topic generally. We've got the paper here, we've got some related information. Um, and your task is going to be uh, to get together in little groups or individually and come up with something interesting about this, this topic. Um, I don't expect you to do a bunch of research. You're not writing a thesis or a dissertation. But I want you to pick one thing that you find really interesting or some, some issue of this, something you pick out of the paper that you didn't expect, or, or, or something to talk about that, that's related to this topic. So the paper from Ruth Pye and a bunch of other folks, a second transmissible cancer in Tasmanian devils. Now when you go, you know, if, you've got, if you go to the hospital, you don't worry about catching cancer, right? You might worry about getting MRSA, you might worry about getting pneumonia, but you don't worry about getting cancer. Why not? Cancer, cancer is not considered to be an infectious disease, right? But what a cancer is, is cells in your own body that have gone haywire for some reason and are growing out of control. And, and, you, and, and if it's dangerous, it usually means that it's, it's acquired the ability to, to move to other parts of your body. That is, it's metastatic and can cause trouble that way. Um, but if you take cancer cells from one person and put them in a different person, that person's um, immune system will immediately recognize and kill them, right? Um, usually. There are only a handful of cases where a, a, a cancer has, has essentially turned into a transmissible disease. And there, there are four well-established cases of this. Two of them are in Tasmanian devils. The other two, the one that they, they overlooked when they wrote this paper is a case in Siberian hamsters where someone noticed that in these hamsters in a cage that the cancer was being spread and it turns out that it, that it was leukemia. Um, the mosquitoes would bite an infected, uh, a diseased hamster and then transmit the cancer cells to a second hamster. And some work was done and it was shown that it really was the cells, the cancer cells that were transmitted, not you know, like a, a cancer-inducing virus or something like that. That one's not been very well studied. There is one in soft-shell clams that's been better studied. This also was a leukemia um, in which uh, the, the clams can get, go, the, the disease can go from one clam to another. Um, I, I didn't look up very much information about that. I don't know that much about it. Apparently, the diagnostic is that their blood is turbid with can these cancer cells. Um, I, and I think it's trans, I don't know how it's transmitted from one clam to another, to tell you the truth. Another case, actually the most well-studied case, is in dogs. And it's actually quite common. It's called Sticker's disease. It's a venereal disease. Um, common primarily in rural parts of the world, third world nations, etc. You know, two, two dogs make happy, and one of them gets the disease from the other. It's not metastatic. Um, it's, a, it's a benign cancer. It's not metastatic, but it does get transferred around the different parts of the dog because they lick themselves and nibble and so forth, and they end up spreading it to other parts of their body. Um, normally, it's not fatal. It fades away pretty quickly. The body recognizes it as, um, as foreign, and, and over the course of a few months, uh, the tumors grow up, and then they fade away as they're rejected. Um, and and it, in, in places where people worry about that are usually strays and wild dogs and that kind of stuff. But in places where um, people in, in have access to veterinary care and their dog gets it, you, you just treat it with a very mild anti-cancer drug, leucophorin or something like that, and the cancers go away like that. It's no, no big deal. Um, a pretty fair fraction of dogs in equatorial parts of the world have this. It's quite common. Um, but Tasmanian devil is another matter. And so the Tasmanian devil disease, the, 
was originally discovered in the mid 90s by a wildlife photographer where this they found these Tasmanian devils with these huge cancers on their faces. And, and, and it's, excuse me? Oh. And so they would get these, these facial tumors. Um, it spread from one Tasmanian devil to another. These animals are quite aggressive. That's why the cartoon has a Tasmanian devil that turns out of the they're, they're really, really aggressive. And they, they territorially, and in, in sex, the case of sexual contact, they bite each other on their faces. And a diseased animal will then transmit the cancer cells to the face of the next animal, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, it's, a, it's lethal. Um, these, these cancers grow and grow, and the animals can't feed, and they die of starvation. It's decimating the Tasmanian devil population. Um, the Tasmanian devils are in big trouble anyway, uh, loss of habitat, uh, poor fertility, because they are highly inbred, we'll get back to that. Um, but this disease is like the nail in the coffin, and, and, and the animal is in real significant danger of going extinct as a result. So how, how does this cancer evade the immune system? Why is this cancer transmissible? When you understand from the biology of the animals why they transfer the cancer cells to the new ones, but why does it take root? The reason is because Tasmanian devils are essentially all clones. Uh, they're extremely inbred. And so there really isn't any difference. It's like a population of identical twins. And so the, as, far as, the an, as far as the animal is concerned, those tumors are just like a tumor in themselves. And so the immune system puts up a, a meager fight, and, and it's not good enough. The original Tasmanian devil facial disease um, was the result of a female with Schwann cell cancer. And so you know it's female because it's got, gene, it's got X, uh, two alleles of all the X genes. It doesn't actually have X chromosomes, that, but the DNA is scattered amongst the other chromosomes. And, and there's two alleles of everything, so you know it was a female. Um, Schwann cell, because if you, if you take the cancer and do a transcriptome, ana transcriptome analysis, the gene expression in these cells is highly related to those of Schwann cells. You guys remember what Schwann cells are? The cells that cover axons and, 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 and facilitate transmission of action potentials along nerves. So sometime in the early 90s, presumably some female Tasmanian devil got this, this, this Schwann cell disease. Um, maybe on a facial nerve or, or in the brain, something like that, and it was transmitted to other animals and extra fruit. This paper describes the discovery that not all Tasmanian devil facial disease is caused by this cancer, but there's a second kind of cancer that mimics it, um, but is a completely independent evolution. So how do they know this? So here's the geography of it. They test these animals. When they find them, they test them for the cancer, you know, and, and they look at them. And it turns out that in five animals, I think five, they find lesions that are indistinguishable from the traditional uh, Tasmanian double facial tumors. <coughs> but when they did the analysis, it's not the same thing. The cells don't look the same. Histologically, so facial tumor one, facial tumor two. You can see that the, the this morphology of the cells is completely different. Well, that's interesting enough. So let's do a karyotype, right? Cancer cells have weird karyotypes. That's part of the whole cancerous process. I don't know what's going on. It's still recording, but it it, it the the. This part of it doesn't change. So here's the karyotype of a Tasmanian devil. Tasmanian devils are like most creatures. They don't have 50 chromosomes. Um, that's pretty unusual. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six chromosomes and the sex chromosomes. This is Tasmanian devil tumor one karyotype. 
So there is no chromosome 2. Chromosome 1 is there. And then there are even these chromosomes where there are homologs, you can see that there are differences between the karyotype of the disease tumor and the normal cells. So these are markers. These chromosomes, you can look at that and look at the bands and, and tell that this is not normal. And those differences are unique to Tasmanian devil facial disease one, and they are consistent no matter what animal you get it from, they have the same karyotype. There are four disease-specific chromosomes. A again, these, the DNA is all the same, right? or at least generally so, but they're rearrangements. And so the chromosomes are they're bits missing and added to the normal chromosomes, and then these other chromosomes are assembled from bits of the others. There's no X chromosome here, there's no sex chromosomes, but the DNA from X is scattered amongst the others. These four are karyotypes from these for four of these animals that are, again, morphologically indistinguishable from Tasmanian devil facial tumors, but you can see that karyotypes are quite different than either the normal or the traditional facial disease karyotype. They do have chromosome 2. They have an X and a Y. And so in my view, this is the most, the clearest proof that these diseases are distinct from traditional Tasmanian devil facial disease because these tumors came from a male. They have Y. And they go on and they, they, they the, in the paper, they go back and they, they show, for example, that, that the animal, the disease is um, heterozygous for all the X allele markers they look for, whereas the traditional one is not, it's homozygous, homo, excuse me, this, this, the traditional ones are heterozygous, this new one is homozygous. Um, and then they go through and look at some SNPs and show that they're different. You also notice there's this giant thing of um, supporting information, papers these days usually have that, I'm not going to go through that. So the take-home lesson is, at least in these handful of animals, they have Tasmanian double facial disease, but it's a different cancer with a different origin. And so two transmissible cancers in one species, presumably because they're so inbred that this sort of thing can happen. I mean, anytime a, a, a Tasmanian devil gets some kind of facial cancer, eventually it could be transmitted and take over. So, what kinds of questions does, does this raise? I've got some information here, links to some Wikipedia sites on devil's disease and canine transmissible, transmissible venereal tumors. Um, there's some PubMed lists. There's this paper about cancer in hamsters and soft shell clams. Your task then is to get together and find something interesting about this. Come up with an answer or a question uh, to something that you find interesting. And I, I, I posted one here as more or less a prompt. I don't usually do this. In my view, I think these transmissible cancers are a really interesting case where you've got essentially a giant evolutionary leap. These tumor cells, for example, in, in, in Tasmanian devils, those aren't really Tasmanian devil cells anymore, in my view. That's a new species by any reasonable definition. This is an evolutionary leap where, where you go from this warm-blooded, mammalian, free-living, carnivorous creature to essentially a, a unicellular or colonial parasite. Now, yeah, in the case of the Tasmanian devil, it can only infect Tasmanian devils right now. But there's a lot of concern about a related group of animals called the quolls in Australia. Closely enough related to Tasmanian devils, there's a handful of species Perhaps they could infect those too. Um, in the case of can, uh, canine um, stickers disease, that has already spread to related canids, and so not it, the the disease originated in wolves and was and it was it's, um, carried down. It happened long ago, and so it's in domestic dogs as well. But it's now it's 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 
built in, it's evolved ways to evade the immune system, and it now can affect coyotes and fox. So what if dogs went extinct? You would have this disease infecting coyotes and wolves and so forth, and its origin in the animal kingdom would be gone. In what way is that not a new parasitic species? Anyway, that's the thing I find most interesting about this. A um, lot of interest, of course, in, in the potential for transmissible cancers in humans. Um, I see some evidence that there's concern about the, the potential for transmission of cancers between identical twins. It would be a little bit analogous to this Tasmania devil thing. Um, I did find one instance where this has been verified. Did it actually happen? Um, there's, someone pointed out a paper here. Here we go. Paul did. Where cancer was transmitted from a patient to a doctor during surgery. Happens all the time in, well, not all the time, but it happens frequently in the case of transplant patients where the person gets a disease organ without it being detected. And because they're under potent immunosuppressants, the cancer spreads because the immune system is essentially non-existent. Um, that's why their uh, organs are screened so carefully, one of the reasons. Um, what about other situations? Are there other situations where this could happen? I don't know the answer to that. What about other animals? Are there other animals where this could happen? What about cheetahs? Cheetahs are also severely inbred. Has anyone ever seen it in cheetahs? What other kind of creatures? Anyway, have fun. You'll see that some folks have already posted it. When, when, when you get together in your group, you know, write up something, come up with something interesting, and post it on the, on the website just as these folks have already done. Um, feel free to do this anytime. Sometime this weekend, you need to go back and write a second comment. Look at what other people have said and post a reply of some kind to a previous post. A rebuttal, an agreement and why you agree, maybe something they haven't thought about, whatever you want, all right? The post that you put as a group, make sure you put everybody's name on it, right? Everyone has to get credit for that, everyone in your group. And then when you post back later individually, you know, make sure that your name is on there. If you use the right account, it should be, but um, you know, be cautious of that, all right? Fantastic. Go to it.